Well, uh, let's turn to God's Word. Uh, we're going to turn to the book of 2 Corinthians tonight, 2 Corinthians, and we're going to read from chapter 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. <clears throat> I want to read the first 11 verses of this chapter. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. <clears throat> Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God that is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in the whole of Achaia, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction that we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer, so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. Well, <clears throat> I want to take this opportunity today and tomorrow to uh, encourage your hearts and bring comfort to your hearts. I think the last couple of years have taken their toll, haven't they? And uh, I get the impression that many of us as the Lord's people are feeling a bit weary at the moment and perhaps even a bit discouraged feeling perhaps spiritually flat. I don't know whether that's true of you, but I certainly know a number of Christians I think that's true of. And so I want to take this opportunity to point us back to some of the comforts and encouragements of the gospel. But also, I want to do this because, you know, you don't need to go on very long in the Christian life before you realise that Christians suffer. That Christians don't have any immunity from suffering. And in fact, you soon realise that some Christians suffer an awful lot, don't they? And there are different reactions to that, of course, when we begin to realise that. Uh, for some Christians, they seem to refuse to accept that reality. Well, that is the way it should be. Uh, there is a strain of teaching around, isn't there? Uh, it takes different forms, but essentially it goes like something like this. God loves you, and so he doesn't want you to suffer. And uh, didn't Jesus take your suffering on the cross? So this suffering in your life, it must be the work of the devil. And what you need to do is by prayer and faith, Claim that victory in the Lord Jesus Christ and that suffering will disappear. But others who uh, perhaps are a bit better taught from God's word, they don't fall for that line. They realise the Bible says that Christians suffer. 
and they know verses uh, which speak of God working in their lives, like Romans 8, 28, and yet perhaps they come to a place in their Christian lives where they just feel overwhelmed by suffering in their own lives or suffering in the lives of those around them. People who love the Lord, people who serve the Lord, and they don't understand. And there are doubts and questions and fears that, that come up. And they don't seem to be able to deal with them sometimes. And sometimes Christians end up feeling very weak in faith because of the reality of suffering. And there's a danger then that they can even start to become bitter in their hearts towards the Lord. Why should this happen? It's as if suffering causes them to, to trip up in their faith. And they just don't seem to be able to come to terms with the suffering that the Lord has allowed in their lives or in the lives of others that they love. And what James says in his letter, you know, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, it just seems like a world away. Well, does the Bible give us any help in coming to terms with, with suffering and coming out the other side of them? Not bitter and full of doubts and fears, but strengthened in our faith and in having a hope that's, in, that's greater than when we went in. Well, it does. The Bible does give us help in this. It doesn't just exhort us to, uh, to be strong. It shows us how and why we can know God's comfort in our sufferings. And over these three sessions, I, I want to explore this theme in, in uh, 2 Corinthians the theme of how God gives his people comfort and hope in the face of suffering and death. We're going to be looking at chapter 1 tonight, and then tomorrow we'll look at um, passages in chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5. But God's people have always suffered, haven't they? From the very beginning. You think right back to the book of Genesis and Cain and Abel. It didn't take very long before great suffering to come to God's people. Abel, a man of faith, accepted by God on the basis of that faith, and yet Cain, his brother, hated him, jealous of him, and murders him. From the very beginning, the godly have suffered. And this letter of Paul's was written during a time of severe trial in his life. After Paul had left Corinth, other preachers and leaders, they came into the church and they were very critical of Paul's ministry. They claimed that their ministry was far superior to his. They had strength. They were strong leaders. Paul was a weak leader, they said. They were trained speakers, trained in the art of public speaking. Paul wasn't. They said they had a presence of authority among people and could influence and command people much better than Paul could. They claimed they had superior gifts to Paul and a track record of success. They could point to the stories and they had letters of commendation from other uh, Christians. If Paul was an apostle, well then they claimed they were super apostles, a higher grade of apostle. They were not as shy about promoting themselves among God's people and claiming all these things and bragging about their gifts and abilities and victories and essentially trying to take over in the church of Corinth. They said it was time to leave Paul's ministry and follow the better ministry, which was their ministry. And For a while, the Corinthians seemed to be taken in by it. They were deceived by it. And it raised many doubts in their minds about Paul's ministry, its value and its authority. And opinions were swayed against Paul. And so this church that Paul had founded as an apostle of God, that God had sent him to, to, to preach the gospel and plant this church as his apostle, this church was now in danger of departing from him, turning their back on Paul. And that put them in great spiritual danger because they weren't just turning away from a man, they were turning away from God's apostle 
who had preached the truth to them. And so by turning away from him, they were in danger of turning away from Christ himself. Paul felt this very keenly. It caused him great distress. If you read the letters to the Corinthians, you'll know. And he was distressed not only because his relationship with his church was in, was, uh, in danger and threatened, and because he loved them on, in that way, but it brought him distress because these were his children in the faith, and yet they appeared to be so near to deserting the Lord and following the charlatan preachers who, who didn't preach the gospel. Well, Paul, it seems, made an attempt to visit Corinth to try and sort things out, <clears throat> to straighten it out, and uh, it didn't go so well, at least in terms of his relationship with the church. It was a very painful visit. Uh, relationships were, were strained to breaking point. And when he returned to Ephesus, where he was conducting his ministry, it seems at the time, he seems to have come to a decision that he wasn't going to go back to Corinth in person until things were sorted out. It was so painful to him. And so he wrote another letter to them and sent it by Titus. Um, many commentators think it was a letter written between 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Uh, Paul refers to it as a severe letter. He was very straight with them and he he called them to repentance. It was a very hard letter for him to write. And he was con very concerned about how they would receive this letter. Which way would it go? And he received news from Titus when Titus returned that they'd received the letter well. They'd repented. And things were beginning to, to be healed, be not only between him and the church, but be between them and, and the Lord. And so now Paul writes 2 Corinthians because there are still situations that need to be sorted out before he comes in person to the church again. And he's trying to, to repair the relationship between him and this church and uh, ready the church for his visit. So this whole situation, you see, was a situation of great distress for Paul. It, it, it was a very difficult time in his ministry. And uh, later on, we'll look at verses 8 to 11, where Paul relates another situation that he's been facing recently, too, which has caused him great distress. One of the most common words in, in, in this letter is the Greek word philipsis, which means afflictions. It crops up again and again, afflictions. Literally, that, the word means um, to be compressed, to be pressed together. Uh, think of a pressure cooker. There are situations in life that feel like that, aren't there? Where you feel under this pressure of affliction. And uh, you wonder when, when the lid's going to blow off, as it were. And so this whole season in Paul's life was, was one of affliction, it appears. Characterised by affliction. In view of this, it's Really striking, isn't it, that Paul begins his letter in the way that he does. After greeting the church um, in the name of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, as he, he often does in his letters, he launches in verse 3 into a benediction, a appeal of praise to God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Uh, what, bearing in mind of all we've just said about the situation that has been going on in Paul's life, don't you think it's amazing that he begins his letter in that way? Praising God for his comfort in his life. And, uh, you know, you might expect him to have started this letter by laying out the faults of the Corinthians, by telling them all the pain that they have been giving to him as an apostle, or unloading all of his woes, all the catalogue of sufferings and trials that have been in his life lately. And instead we get this outburst of praise to God. 
He praises God for his comfort, and not only for the comfort that he has received, but the comfort that he's received on behalf of these Corinthian believers. He praises God, not just because he is being comforted, but because they are going to be comforted too. The comfort that he is being given, God is going to give to them as well. Here's a man with a big heart, isn't it? It's a man with a big heart and a very gracious heart considering all the pain this church has caused him. And there's not a, not a hint of bitterness here, is there? Or a hint of self-pity. And it really makes me ask, you know, how is it possible to be like this? What makes Paul different? And I think the answer of Scripture here is that what makes Paul different is his experience of God. He's experienced the Lord in his trials. And it's made him a man who continues to patiently love God's people with all his heart. Let me give you four quick points about the comfort of God uh, as we see them in, this, in these verses uh, from verse 3 to 11. The first point is this. <clears throat> the comfort has its source in the Father's compassion and comes to us through the work of the Son. It has its source in the Father's compassion and comes to us through the work of the Son. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction. One of the greatest blessings that we've been given as Christians is that we've been given God as our Father. He has made himself our Father. You know, we're prone to think of uh, God's fatherhood in, in human terms, of course, because that, that's what we know of fatherhood. And, of course, there is an analogy there. Uh, but although every good father wants to comfort his children, and there is that analogy, there is also a great difference, isn't there? Uh, there is, a, as it were, a chasm between our desire to comfort our children and, and the love of the Father. You remember Jesus said, <clears throat> if you being evil know how to good, give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? He is the perfect Father. Uh, even the best of fathers in this world are such a an imperfect, poor example of fatherhood compared to him and his heart for his children. Paul says here, he is the father of mercies and the God of all comfort. What's he referring to here? Well, obviously it means, for one thing, that God is the source of all comfort to his people. But I think it, it means something sp more specific than that. Uh, but as Paul goes on in these verses, he he says, God comforts us in all our afflictions. He's the God of all comfort because he comforts us in all our afflictions. In other words, in every kind of affliction. And there are so many different kinds of affliction, aren't there? In all their variety. And in all their depth, however great the afflictions are. His comfort is always appropriate. It's always perfectly fitted to every affliction. It never fails. It's never wanting. You'll never find the heart of God and his comfort running dry or exhausted. This God, he's, he's the epitome of fatherly com compassion. God revealed himself to the people of the Old Testament as a God of mercy and compassion, didn't he? This wasn't just a New Testament thing. Um, you remember God pronounced his name to Moses as Moses wanted to, to see the glory of God. God passed by him and he, he pronounced his name, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. 
uh, God sent Moses to rescue the people from Egypt. You remember in Exodus we're told he, he, was, he saw and heard his people's groanings. He saw their trouble. He, he was moved with compassion for his people. And he sent Moses to redeem them. David's Psalms are full of, of this theme, aren't they? The compassions of God as he, as he pours out his heart to the Lord and speaks of his afflictions and God comforts him. Again and again we see God meeting David in the Psalms. And others too, like, like Joseph and his experience. Jeremiah and all his afflictions. And of course, Job. Uh, James tells us, you've seen the purpose of the Lord and that the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But what was experienced in the Old Testament was not complete. It was, in a sense, just the beginning. All of that was anticipatory of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was looking forward to the age of the Christ, the age of the Messiah that was coming. That's the time when God's comfort would really come to his people. Even David in his Psalms is really looking forward to that. The comfort that he experienced in his sufferings was, was prophetic of the comfort that would come through the Lord Jesus. David was, was God's anointed king, the one who had been given a special covenant by God. And so the comfort that he receives, he receives as God's anointed, looking forward to the comfort that would come through the anointed one, the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah, in his wonderful book, I, I love the book of Isaiah more and more. Isaiah, in his, his, his book, in the second half of his book, particularly chapters 40 to 66, he speaks of this comfort to God's people that's going to come through the servant of the Lord. Chapter 40 opens with these wonderful words, comfort Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, and that she is received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. And Isaiah spoke of the servant of the Lord who, through whom this comfort would come. He would take our sorrows. He would bear our sins. He would be acquainted with grief. And through him, comfort would come to God's people. Forgiveness of sin. And uh, ultimately, a new heavens and a new earth. The Old Testament saints then, they looked forward to the age of Christ when comfort would really arrive for God's people. Uh, Zechariah, when uh, the father of John the Baptist when um, he's filled with the Holy Spirit and he speaks in praise to God. He, in Luke's Gospel, we're, we're told that he says these words. He praises God because the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high. It's a beautiful expression, isn't it? The tender mercy of our God, he says, whereby the sunrise, you think of a dark, long night, and then Christ coming as the sunrise for God's people. And Simeon, who took the Lord Jesus in his arms as a babe, we're told he was a man waiting for the consolation of Israel. He's waiting for the time of comfort for Israel. And so it's in Christ and through his coming into this world, his death and his resurrection, that we, the compassions of God are fully and truly revealed. The Lord Jesus is the one through whom we really see the heart of the Father for us. He comes to redeem us. He comes because God is merciful to sinners. He has compassion upon sinners and rebels like you and me. He comes to take our place. He comes to suffer for our sake, even the death of the cross. And because of his death and his resurrection, in his compassion, the Father lavishes his grace upon us. Behold what manner of love the Father has lavished upon us, John says, that we should be called children of God. And he unites us to his Son. We were on that 
on the quicksand of our sin. That was our foundation. We were sinking into hell itself, weren't we? And he's taken us, he's rescued us, and he's united us to his son. There's no more secure place to be than in Christ, in him, to be hidden in his son and united to him forever. He's given us his son and united us to him and he's given us his spirit so that the spirit comes alongside us to be the comforter, the paraclete, the one who is our helper. And through the indwelling spirit we cry, Abba, Father. And the love of God is poured out into our hearts. This is the compassion of God. This is what God has done to comfort his people, to draw near to them in a sinful and broken world where sin reigns and death reigns and, and the devil is the prince of power of the air. He comes to save and redeem and comfort, bring hope. This is the heart of God revealed through Christ. So God, uh, Paul praises God in in these words, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. It's, we know that suffering will come to us as God's people. But when we're going through a time of suffering or affliction, this is what we need to remember, isn't it? The heart of our Father in heaven. We need to remember the compassions of God. We need to remember our Lord Jesus Christ. We need to remember that God has demonstrated his love to us. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Instead of looking for comfort elsewhere, and there are many places that we can go to for some sort of comfort, but not true comfort. We could turn to those around us. Maybe there are even things that you're tempted to, to look to for comfort that you ought not to. Uh, and the world looks to for comfort. But we don't need to look there, do we? We don't need that. We've got a Father in heaven. The Spirit is within our hearts. We have a Saviour who's shown his love towards us. And through his word and through prayer, we can draw near to him. And we can know his comfort in our lives. Oh, why should I let sorrow reign when such a God is mine, who gives to me and gives again and tells me mine is thine? Maybe you're in that place at the moment where you, you need to go back to your heavenly father the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. <clears throat> but let's move on. Paul tells us here that suffering and comfort are guaranteed in the experience of the Christian. But we'll come back to verse 4 in a minute, but just briefly look at verse 5 here. He says, For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. We share in his sufferings, and we share in comfort too, abundantly. One thing that's essential for us to understand as Christians is that we are identified with the Lord Jesus Christ. This is such an important truth of Scripture. And because we are identified with Christ, because we are in union with the Lord Jesus Christ, that means that we are in union with the one who is the crucified Christ, who died upon the cross, the man of sorrows, who was acquainted with grief. We are united with him. And that means that as God's people, we, we expect suffering and we expect affliction. We expect similar circumstances to our Lord because we belong to him and we're following in his footsteps. Now, in one sense, of course, we can never experience what he experienced. His work was unique, wasn't it? He came as 
the Lamb of God, he came as the substitute for us. And we don't share at all in that. But now, for us, as those in union with him, we do share his experience in other ways. He told his disciples, as the Father sent me, so I send you. He sends us into a world that is rebellious and broken and needs to know him. He warned them, if the world hated me, it will hate you too. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you too. We're told in, in Scripture, aren't we, through much tribulation we must enter heaven. And the Bible warns us that as his sheep, we will experience something of what the shepherd suffered. That we will sometimes feel like we're sheep for the slaughter. Romans chapter 8. In all these things we conquer, Paul says, and yet we are like sheep for the slaughter as God's people. And so suffering is to be expected. That's not easy for us to come to terms with, is it, in our very comfortable Western society where we're so well off and we're so well provided for and where the world around us is constantly telling us that the aim of life is to avoid suffering and to make your life as comfortable as you possibly can. I mean, this is like a mission for many people, isn't it? I, I try to arrange everything in my life for maximum comfort and to avoid all suffering at any cost. That's what the purpose of life is for many people. And many Christians spend, seem to spend their lives trying to avoid suffering. But it's, it's a hopeless situation to do that because if we're going to follow the Lord Jesus, if we're going to follow the Lamb wherever he goes, then suffering will come to us as part of that. We, it's part of God's purpose for us. It's part of his good purpose for us. We understand that we will suffer in a fallen world. And also we understand that if we're going to serve him in the gospel in this world that rejects God, then suffering will come to us there as well. As a result of our witnessing to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and living in a godly way, suffering will come. The Apostle Paul says here that he shared abundantly in Christ's sufferings as an apostle. He took the gospel to people. He was working for people's salvation. And he is rejected, he's persecuted, and the devil attacks him one way after another. And through that, he is experiencing something of what Christ experienced too. As Christ came into this world that rejected him, and the devil attacked our Lord. But there was no other way. There's no other way to bring the gospel to a, a world that's in rebellion. A world where Satan is trying to reign. There's no other way. We have to face the suffering in order to work for people's salvation. Paul wrote to the Colossians, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. So suffering for the Christian is guaranteed. But, and here is the wonderful thing, so is the God, comfort of God. Paul says that here, doesn't he? As we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. We are identified with Christ not only in the path of suffering, Paul says, but also through Christ in the comfort of God. As surely as Jesus died and rose again, the comfort of God is there for his people. The death and resurrection of Christ have secured it. And this brings great meaning and purpose to our sufferings, doesn't it? That we are sharing in Christ's sufferings. That it's with him and for him. And we can know that 
if we are suffering, there is comfort available for us in God. Verse 7, our hope for you, Paul says, is unshaken. For we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. As surely as you belong to his son, God knows how to comfort his children. I don't know what the situation is like in your life at the moment. Maybe, maybe it feels like you're in the winter of the soul. Maybe it feels like you're in the night time. Everything seems dark at the moment. I don't know. But as believers, because we belong to Christ, it isn't just about the night time, is it? There is the morning. It's the God. We belong to the one who rose from the dead. We belong to the one who has secured the comfort of God for us. He's faced the wrath of God for us. He's reconciled us to God. And all the promises of God are yes and amen in the Lord Jesus Christ. So even when it's night time, we know that the morning is coming. Moving on quickly, the experience of suffering and comfort here, Paul tells us, is, it's a communal one. We, we, we experience this together in shared fellowship as God's people. Um, look at verse 4. Uh, Paul says, God who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we, we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Uh, and he says in verse 6, if we are comforted, it is for your comfort and salvation. Uh, sorry, if we are afflicted, it's for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Paul emphasizes their fellowship together in this, that they share in sufferings and they share in the comfort of God together. The Corinthians, of course, were not suffering on the same scale as Paul was. But nevertheless, he says they have the same kind of sufferings. The same purpose of God is, is at work through their sufferings as well as his. And the same comfort of God is experienced through their sufferings. And more than that, he sees his own suffering and comfort as something which is not only for him, but is also for them. It's been given to him so that he can share it in fellowship with them. Paul doesn't see himself like a pond, but like a river. What do I mean by that? Well, God isn't comforting him for it to stop with him. It's not just about him, like water in a pond. It doesn't go anywhere. The purpose of God's comfort is that others might be comforted through this comfort too. Paul is the conduit, the channel. And the comfort that he is experiencing is intended for all of God's people. I wonder if we see our sufferings and the God's comfort in that way. That it's intended for all of God's people, not just for us. You know, we live in a, a very individualistic society, don't we? Where people only ask, what's, what's good for me? What's in it for me? What do I get out of it? And every person likes to think of themselves a bit like an island, you know, self-sufficient, self-determining, and so on. And the world is there to serve me. But that kind of mindset is so far from the way a Christian is supposed to be. It's not the way God made us, and it's not the way he's made the church. Uh, the church has been designed by God in such a way that, that we are united to each other. And we share in fellowship through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the Spirit. Part of becoming like Christ is, is understanding of the fellowship that we have in the church and, and that we are, God intends us to suffer together and know his comfort together. That we are members of one another. That's the nature of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what I think, kept Paul from bitterness and self-pity in his sufferings, isn't it? He wasn't just self-focused in on himself. God, I need your comfort, me, it's all about me. No. 
He knows that he's the servant of the Lord who's, and he's made himself the servant of the Lord gladly so that the comfort that he receives is, is for others as well. He's, he's outward focused, outward looking. and He keeps his heart gracious and kind under suffering as he experiences God's comfort. He's not like a stagnating pond. He's like a river that brings healing and life to others by God's grace. And then finally, Paul reminds us that these things are not just theology, they're reality. Uh, we might be tempted to think tonight that, you know, all this sounds very nice, but how do I know it's not just theology? Nice words, nice thoughts. Well, Paul has given us the theology in verses 3 to 7. But in verses 8 to 11, he relates his recent experience of this, how he's actually experienced this in his life in recent days. Verse 8, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia, for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Paul was in Asia, probably, as we said, in Ephesus, where he stayed for some time. And we know that there was much opportunity there, but also much opposition to his ministry. And the book of Acts tells us something of that. We don't know the specific circumstances that he's relating to here, but they were definitely extreme from the way he describes them. We were so utterly burdened, he says, beyond our strength. It does make you wonder what it was, doesn't it? This affliction, this pressure that came upon him like the pressure cooker, it seemed beyond what he was able to bear, he says. So much so that he says we despaired of life itself. That's quite something for the Apostle Paul to say, isn't it? When you think of all that he's suffered already in his life, all these, I mean, what he was used to in his life, as it were. It's quite something for him to say. We felt like we had received a sentence of death. It felt like it was all over. That's how it felt. And he felt the despair coming. But by the grace of God, he didn't despair. He didn't give up. And God met him in that situation. The one who comforts us, he says, in all our afflictions. Even a situation as severe as this, where he felt it was certain death. Why did it happen? Well, we don't know all the reasons, but Paul the, uh, tells us of one purpose of God here. Verse 9, indeed we felt that we'd received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on the God who raises the dead. This experience brought him to rely on the Lord more and less on himself. It, it turned his, his heart more towards the Lord in reliance. It humbled him. It made him aware of his frailty and his weakness. So that he looked more to God. And, and as he says through the book of Second Corinthians, and it, it's in weakness that he experiences the power of God. It's it's when he's brought low that God lifts him up. It's when he's brought to the point of knowing that he's nothing without the Lord. But the Lord is able to fill him and use him. So he was made to rely on the Lord, not in himself. The one who raises the dead. He felt like it was certain death. But he cast himself on the Lord, the one who raises the dead. And Paul realizes that the comfort that he has received, being delivered from such a deadly peril, is for the whole church. It strengthened his faith. Verse 10. He delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us. On him we've set our hope that he will deliver us again. It strengthened his faith. 
But he realized it wasn't just for him. It was for all God's people. You also, verse 11, must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. He encourages the Corinthians to pray for him so that they might share with him in the experience of trials and deliverances that as they pray for him and as God answers those prayers, that they might share all the more in the comfort and the strengthening of their faith with him, together with him, and together in fellowship, then they might be brought to praise God. You know, it's as we share with others in their sufferings, and especially through prayer, that we, we are brought into deeper fellowship and we experience, we not only go through the sufferings together, but then we receive the comfort of God together. And we praise the Lord together. And this deepens our unity and fellowship in the gospel. And it brings glory to God. As we pray for, for missionaries who are on the front line. As we pray for, for servants of the Lord and for one another as we remember those who are struggling a church that walks with one another in suffering and walks with one another in answer to in the answers to prayer as God comforts us is a church that is being bound together in the love and unity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it becomes a thankful church so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. The passage then ends where it began, doesn't it? It's like we come full circle. It ends in praise to God for his comfort in answer to prayer. Just where it started. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Only now, the difference is that the <coughs> praise of one person in verse 3 has become the praise of the whole church in verse 11. The praise of the one has become the praise of the many. As sufferings have been shared and prayers have ascended and the comfort of God has been seen and known in answer to prayer, the praise has been multiplied and greater glory has been brought to God. This is what the Lord wants church life to look like. And... It's a foretaste of heaven to come, of glory to come, isn't it? Because, that we, friends, we are looking forward to that day when the comfort of God will come to us in full, without reserve. That's what we're looking forward to. That's where we're heading. We are trusting in the God of the resurrection. And this season, this veil of tears, that we're passing through now, it's temporary because the Lord is bringing us through. I will, when you go through the waters, I will be with you, he says. And he's bringing us through to the place where one day he will wipe the tears from his people's eyes. And, you know, we'll rejoice on that day, not only because he wipes the tears away from our eyes, but because... He also wipes the tears away from all the eyes of our brothers and our sisters. We will love one another perfectly on that day. And that will be our joy, that, that he comforts all of his people on that day. And we'll tell of his mercies, won't we? And his compassions towards us. We'll add our testimony and our story to the stories of all his people. And we'll give him our praise. We'll tell how the God of compassion and mercy had compassion and mercy upon us in our sin and rescued us saved us from our sin and all evil and death itself and all our troubles and he brought us safely through and he brought us everlasting comfort and consolation in his son the lord jesus christ the god of all comfort that's our god that's the one we're trusting in We give him praise. May he continue to work in our hearts and assure them of his love 
and uh, that is comfort is our portion and that it's enough it's enough more than enough let's just uh, pray together father we thank you for this portion of your word we thank you that you're a god who meets your people in all their sufferings and their afflictions and lord sometimes it can seem a very dark night of the soul but we thank you that you are faithful we thank you lord that even when we are tempted to despair that you are faithful that you bring your people through that you you comfort our hearts you strengthen our faith you are faithful to the end we thank you for the comfort of the Holy Spirit that's, that's real, that's a reality in our lives. It's not words on paper, but you're the God who, who's with us and who meets with us. We thank you, Lord, what a privilege it is to know you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We give you our worship and our praise in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. <laughs>